Hello everyone and welcome to the webinar. My name is Janet Anderson and I am the Commissioner of the Aged Care Quality and Safety Commission. Let me start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the lands on which we gather together today across Australia uh, and to pay my respects to Elders past and present. I also extend my acknowledgement and respect to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who might be participating in today's webinar. Today, we're going to be discussing key reforms which are coming into place uh, from the 1st of December this year uh, and to share with you some material, some information in relation to each of those reforms. I have with me today uh, a, a panel of five people with uh, uh, that number of presenters as well. Uh, Amy Laffin will lead out. Amy is from the department. She's a first assistant secretary there. She'll be followed by Anne Wunsch, Michelle Bampton, and Emma Jobson, who are three executive directors within the commission. And I forgot to include uh, Lisa Peterson, who's an assistant commissioner, uh, who will also have a, have a place on the panel. So we have a lot of information to get through, but if you've signed up uh, to participate in this webinar, then quite clearly you've, you've already indicated that you have a very keen interest in learning more about the reforms. By way of preface, I do want to say that there are some things which are not yet clear. We don't yet have access to all of the detail that relates to each of these reforms. And that might be frustrating. And certainly some of the questions you've submitted before the webinar suggest that you are looking for that detail. We understand that. As soon as that detail is available, we will make it uh, available to you. But for today, one of our aims in holding this webinar is to hear from you. What are the questions you have? What are the things that you most want to learn about in order that you can be well equipped to do the work you need to do from December? So use the chat function to submit questions that you have as we run through. I will do my best to take those questions when we've fin finished the, uh, the presentation, but I suspect it won't be possible to get through all of them. We will have a question and answer uh, tab uh, on our website which we will continue to add to. So any questions we don't get to today, we will uh, thematically group and address on our website. So my strongest recommendation to you is keep an eye on the website. Without further ado, let me move to our first presenter. Amy Laffin uh, is, as I say, a first assistant secretary in the Department of Health. Uh, and she's going to talk to us about the act that has recently been passed and the reforms nested within that act. Thanks, Amy. Thanks very much, Janet. And thank you all very much for your time today and enjoy, um, in joining us to talk on these important topics. So as you'd all be aware, the Royal Commission into Aged Care Quality and Safety considered a range of issues regarding quality and safety in aged care. Following 23 public hearings over 99 days, 641 witnesses and over 10,000 public submissions, the final report of the Royal Commission made 148 recommendations. The government of the time delivered a response and committed around $18 billion to aged care reforms. The current government has committed to implementing Royal Commission recommendations and has made a number of election commitments focused on the aged care system. The nine measures that were included in the Aged Care and Other Legislation Amendment, the Royal Commission Response Act 2022, respond to several recommendations of the Royal Commission's final report. Most of the measures in the Act were considered by the 46th Parliament. However, the first version of the Royal Commission Bill was not agreed to ahead of the election being called. This government considered the bill introduced by the previous government. They made some changes and additions and removed some of the amendments that related to worker screening. And the amendments, so the Royal Commission Response Act, was the first piece of legislation passed by the 47th Parliament to prevent any further delay in the important funding, quality and safety reforms that were enabled by the amendments. The timing also highlights the government's commitment to aged care reform. So as a bit of a recap, I'll outline each me measure of that bill with a particular focus on the four measures that we're going to speak about in today's webinar. Schedule 1 introduces a new aged care subsidy calculation which responds to recommendation 120 of the Royal Commission. The Australian National Aged Care Classification, or ANAC, will replace the aged care funding instrument as the residential aged care subsidy calculation model. This will provide more equitable funding to providers that better matches residents' needs and the costs of delivering care. 
Schedule 2 provides a legislative basis for the star rating system, which responds to Recommendation 24. The publication of this information will allow Australians and their families to make meaningful comparisons of the quality and safety of residential aged care services and the approved providers of those services. Schedule 3 introduces a code of conduct and banning order scheme, which recommends which responds to recommendations 77 and 103 of the Royal Commission. The Code of Conduct will commence on the 1st of December this year. It's the first element of government's national registration scheme for personal care workers. The code sets out standards of behaviour for approved providers, their aged care workers, governing persons to, and governing persons to ensure that services are delivered to older Australians in a safe, competent and respectful manner. The Commissioner will be able to take action in relation to compliance with the code, as well as enforcement action for, substanti for substantiated breaches. The code and the consultation summary report will soon be available on the department's website. Through consultation, stakeholders broadly supported the requirements for providers to comply with the code of conduct and take reasonable steps to ensure that workers comply with the code. They also broadly supported the requirement for aged care workers and governing persons to comply with the code. Stakeholders broadly felt that it was appropriate for us to draw on the NDIS code of conduct as the basis for this code. We share many providers and workers between our sectors, and it makes sense that an aged care recipient has the same protections as an NDIS participant, and that workers and governing persons are held to the same standard. Work to develop the remaining elements of the National Re Registration Scheme in line with government selection commitments is ongoing, and that scheme will include requirements for ongoing training, English proficiency, and criminal history screening. Schedule 4 extends the Serious Incident Response Scheme to home care and flexible care delivered in a home and community setting, which responds to Recommendation 100 of the Royal Commission. The purpose of this scheme, known as SIRS, is to manage, report and prevent incidents in order to protect the health, safety and well-being of older Australians. This extension seeks to level the protections for aged care recipients in all aged care settings and create a consistent mechanism of oversight between both the residential and home sectors. The extension of SIRS to in-home and community settings was informed by a prevalence study, which found that incidents were occurring in these settings. The study also considered options for applying SIRS to in-home care and community settings, which was, the subject, which was also the subject of the consultation process. Feedback from that consultation process supported the extension of SIRS to in-home and community settings. These new requirements will help build provider capacity to record and respond to incidents, to identify, manage and resolve risks and formalise ways of ensuring continuous improvement in care practices that will reduce the number of preventable incidents in the future. The expansion will ensure that um, approved providers of home and flexible care provided in a home and community setting report those incidents to Aged Care Quality and Safety Commissioner, which will enable the government oversight and ensure that the risk of abuse and neglect towards vulnerable older Australians receiving aged care service, services is minimised. The expansion of SIRS into home care will align to the greatest possible extent with residential home care system, but it is expected that there will be some nuances to take into consideration the difference in operating environments. This is in response to feedback received during the consultation process on options for applying SIRS to home and community care. Shortly, the department will release a draft of a legislative instrument that will extend SIRS to home care, which will be made available on the department's website. The instrument will detail the incident categories that will differ for in-home care. Schedule 5 strengthens the governance of approved providers. The governing body sets the provider's culture and focuses the organisation on safety, quality and the best interests of the consumers. Provider governance and management directly impact on all aspects of aged care. The Royal Commission reported that deficiencies in the governance and leadership of some approved providers have resulted in shortfalls in the quality and safety of care. It found that some boards and governing bodies lack professional knowledge about the delivery of aged care, including particular clinical expertise. The Royal Commission recommended that new legislation be introduced to strengthen provider governance. The government has now introduced this legislation in response to the Royal Commission recommendations 88 to 90. From 1st of December, there'll be new governance responsibilities for approved providers in relation to membership of their governing boards and the establishment of advisory bodies. The strengthened governance arrangements will improve the transparency and accountability of providers 
and aims to change the culture from the top down. The legislation also introduces new reporting responsibilities for providers, which will help care recipients and their families to understand key details of provider operations, including financial information and to assist with making decisions and informed choices. This information will be published on My Aged Care. Schedule 6 enhances information sharing across sectors, which relates to improved information sharing noted by the Royal Commission. These changes aim to provide consistent quality and safety protections for consumers and reduce regulatory burden for cross-sector providers and workers. Schedule 7 increases financial and prudential oversight, which, which responds to Recommendation 134. The intended outcome of these amendments are greater visibility and oversight of providers' financial viability and refundable accommodation deposits and bonds, streamlined legislative interpretation and greater incentives disincentives for providers against misuse of refundable accommodation deposits and bonds. Schedule 8 broadens the functions of the renamed Independent Health and Aged Care Pricing Authority, which responds to recommendations 6, 11, 115 and 139. The functions will provide, will include providing advice on health care pricing and costing matters, aged care pricing and costing matters and the performance of certain functions under the Aged Care Act. The amendments will also establish new governance arrangements and appointment processes for the pricing authority to reflect and enhance responsibilities, the enhanced responsibilities and integrated functions of the pricing authority. And finally, Schedule 9 addresses the issue of informed consent arrangements in respect to the use of restrictive practices in residential aged care, which responds to Recommendation 17. The Royal Commission found that the overuse of restrictive practices in aged care is a major quality and safety issue that impacts the liberty and dignity of older Australians. However, it is recognised in some aged care that some aged care residents require specialised support in the form of restrictive practices so that they don't endanger themselves or others. That being said, the use of restrictive practices should be used as a last resort to prevent harm, only to the extent necessary must be proportionate to the risk and in the least restrictive form for the shortest time necessary. Legislation was enacted in 2021 to strengthen requirements for the use of restrictive practices. The recent legislation is intended to address gaps in some state and territory guardianship and consent laws that were subsequently identified. The recent legislation further strengthens consent requirements for the use of restrictive practices. It allows for changes to the quality of care principles, which set out which will set out a hierarchy of people or bodies who can give informed consent to the use of restrictive practices when the care recipient lacks the capacity to consent. It is intended that the Commonwealth legislation will only apply where the care recipient does not have capacity and the relevant jurisdiction laws do not clearly authorise a person to consent to the restrictive practice on behalf of the care recipient or where there are delays in appointments by the jurisdiction tribunals authorising the relevant persons to provide that consent. The department has released a draft of that legislative instrument that sets out arrangements of persons or bodies who may give informed consent to the use of restrictive practices. That's currently on our website. All of these measures are fundamentally aimed at improving the quality and safety of aged care to protect the health, rights and dignity of older Australians. In developing these nine measures, the department's role has been to further examine the issues raised by the Royal Commission and to engage with stakeholders on how to address the issues. All of the numerous consultation processes, whether they be public consultation through discussion papers or targeted consultation through workshops, have fed into the policy and legislative process. It helps the government to identify any additional issues and risks. The Act sets out the legislative framework for these measures at a high level, but as you know, much of the detail and much of what you're most interested in will be included in the subordinate legislation. The Department is in the process of developing the subordinate legislation for consideration by ministers. This process includes more consultation, including with other government agencies, especially the Aged Care Quality and Safety Commission, to ensure the legislation is robust and will achieve its intended outcome. Um, I appreciate due to the time limitations, I've only been able to provide a bit of a high level guide today, but I'll remain on the online and be part of the panel session. Thank you all very much for your time. Okay. Thank you, Amy. Uh, and that was definitely a, a high speed tour through the Act. And I am sure that uppermost in people's minds is the question, wow, how do we get to grips with some of this detail? 
Today is the first in a series of webinars where we are determined to assist you uh, in that endeavour. I've already had a question come through as to whether this webinar is being taped. The answer is yes. Uh, there will be a recording of the webinar on our website uh, after we've finished. So uh, if, uh, if you have colleagues who haven't been able to join today, by all means, bring that to their attention. Let me move now to Lisa Peterson to talk about the work that the Commission is determined to do with you, to make available to you, to assist you to come to grips with the new expectations which will apply from December. Lisa. Thanks very much, Janet, and good morning, everybody. Look, we know how important it is to provide you with clarity on the new reforms, and we'll be supporting you with guidance and information that builds out from the legislation that sets the framework for these new measures. So that the government is still finalising the details and the rules that many of you will be keen to understand, and that will become available through the release of what we call exposure drafts of subordinate legislation, as Amy mentioned. And, and that provides a, an opportunity for public consultation on that legislation. And then there's a further step for government to finalise and turn this into law. But the release of those exposure drafts is the key step that needs to happen before the Commission can finalise and publish our guidance materials. So you can expect to see our guidance content very shortly after the release of those exposure drafts. But of course, work's already underway based on what we know at this point. And we're looking forward to doing some targeted consultation with sector representatives on the draft guidance materials later this month. We're working really closely with the department to ensure that there's clear information available for providers, consumers and workers. So leading up to 1 December, we'll be supporting you through online resources, which will include uh, guidance materials, fact sheets, videos, posters. There'll be online learning programs through the Aged Care Learning Information Solution, ALICE, and there'll be further webinars on the key reform measures. We know it's really important that our education products are fit for purpose and meet your needs. So we'll be producing as much as we can in the lead up to 1 December, but we won't stop there. We'll continue to develop and to adjust our tools and information based on your feedback as you start to operationalise these new requirements in your services. We're holding this introductory webinar again next Tuesday. So if you've got colleagues that were not able to join today, please let them know there'll be an opportunity to do so next week. And then there'll be a further series of webinars on the specific uh, reform measures where we'll talk about how we expect these to work from a regulatory perspective. So for the Serious Incident Response Scheme, SIRS, for in-home care, we'll have an introduction to incident management systems in late September. We're just locking in the date. Um, on the 10th of October, we'll talk about SIRS reportable incidents. And on the 17th of October, reporting under SIRS. Uh, for Aged Care Code of Conduct, uh, there'll be a session for providers on the 7th of October and a session for aged care workers on the 11th of November. And we'll have a session on strengthening provider governance on the 27th of October. So we've created a new aged care reform page on our website. Um, if you go to www.agecarequality.gov.au, that'll take you to our homepage and you'll find a link to the reforms page. Um, really encourage you to check in with that regularly. Um, what you'll find there is updated information and registration links for the webinars and also the recordings. And our Q and A's, as Janet mentioned, we'll be responding to all of the questions that we hear today, uh, and particularly those that we aren't able to able to get through. And you'll also be able to submit questions um, via the Aged Care Reform page, or send us an email at Aged Care Reform at agedcarequality.gov.au. So really encourage you to uh, check in with our website regularly and, of course, stay up to date with all of the aged care reform measures and consultation opportunities through the Department of Health's website. Thanks, Janet. Okay. Uh, so uh, Lisa quoted a number of dates. You'll want to check with the website just to make sure that you've jotted those down if they are of interest to you, and I certainly hope they are. I'm going to introduce now Anne Wunsch, who is an executive director in the Commission, and Anne has responsibility for overseeing uh, the Serious Incident Response Scheme program for the Commission. And she's going to talk to us a bit about the expansion of SERS into home services. Anne. Thanks, Janet. Um, and look, it's great to be here today to speak to such a large audience about the Serious Incident Response Scheme. Some of you will already be familiar with a SERS. Uh, the Serious Incident Response Scheme um, was first implemented in residential aged care services subsidised by the Australian Government uh, back in April 2021. 
So SIRS is an initiative to help prevent and reduce incidents of abuse and neglect in aged care services. And I'm here to talk uh, a bit more about the extension of SIRS into home services, which commences on 1 December 2022. So from this date, all home service providers will also need to commence reporting under the Serious Incident Response Scheme and notify the Commission when reportable incidents occur. Home services providers include providers of home care packages, Commonwealth Home Support Program Services, that is CHSP, and flexible care services through which short-term restorative care is provided in a home care setting. This reform reinforces existing requirements for home care service providers to manage and take reasonable actions to prevent incidents with a focus on the safety, health, well-being and quality of life of aged care consumers. From 1 December this year, providers of home services must also report incidents using the Serious Incident Response Scheme tile on the My Aged Care Service Provider portal. So information about registering and using the portal is available on the Department of Health and Aged Care's website. So under SIRS, um, there are eight types of reportable incidents. The Commission must be notified of all reportable incidents. This includes incidents that occur or are alleged or suspected to have occurred and includes incidents involving a consumer or consumers with cognitive impairment, such as dementia. All home services providers have a responsibility to ensure that their staff and their subcontractors are aware of their duties around the notification of, of serious incidents. In readiness for SIRS, home services providers are encouraged to review their existing IMS that they have in place now. Is it fit for purpose? Does it support you to prevent and respond to incidents at your service? You may need to carry out a gap analysis to ensure that you have each of the four key components of an incident management system. You should consider, for example, whether you have the appropriate policies and procedures, a tool to record incidents, a training program for your staff, and governance and accountability arrangements and mechanisms, which would include incident management where a subcontractor is involved. Now, while all incident management systems should have these key components in common, the detailed design of, of each provider's incident management system is likely to be different. And this is because your incident management system should be tailored to your service, its size, location and type of services provided to aged care consumers. You should undertake this review of your incident management system ahead of 1 December 2022 to ensure that you can maintain a continuous improvement process for the management and prevention of incidents. Now, the Commission is producing a suite of resources, as Lisa mentioned, um, to help guide providers of home services to understand and meet reporting obligations under the Serious Incident Response Scheme. A really great resource to become familiar with is the Commission's Effective Incident Management Systems Best Practice Guidance, which offers practical information to help providers embed a best practice incident management system within their service. This is available on our web website. Now, for a shorter read, you should take a look at our Effective Incident Management um, Systems um, fact sheet, which is also on our website. Lisa also mentioned um, some of the online um, uh, introductory um, uh, learning modules. Uh, we have one called Elements of Effective Incident Management Systems, and it's available through the Aged Care Learning Information Solution, ALICE. Now, there'll also be a number of other opportunities to learn about SIRS, including um, joining the Commission's facilitated webinars and we'll have a number of those specifically designed around 
SIRS. Uh, these are coming soon. You also might uh, have an opportunity to attend one of our face-to-face -face information sessions. These will be provided in October in capital city locations. And we also have, um, and it's available now, the SIRS inquiry line where providers can email or call the Commission to seek further guidance. The email address for this is sirs at agecarequality.gov.au or by phoning 1800 081 549. Now, as both Amy and Lisa mentioned, um, you're going to be very keen to understand um, what is in the subordinate legislation. So um, the Department of Health and Aged Care's um, website will have that um, available. Um, uh, we'll publish it once it's available. And that will provide you with a bit more detail on the scheme arrangements. Thank you. OK, great. Thanks, Anne. A uh, few more questions I'll field quickly. Uh, that our website address again, and I know we said it quickly, it's all one word, aged care quality, A-G-E-D-C-A-R-E-Q-U-A-L-I-T-Y dot gov dot A-U. So uh, have a look, go online and see what you can find. Um, two questions about SIRS briefly. One related to the commencement date, as Anne said, it's the 1st of December this year. And the second is, uh, are Commonwealth Home Support Program services included in the extension of SIRS? And the answer is yes. Okay, moving on to the next speaker. Michelle Bampton uh, is another executive director in the Commission. And Michelle is in charge of the introduction within the Commission from a regulatory standpoint of the new Code of Conduct. So I would invite Michelle to uh, give us a few words on that. Thank you, Janet. Hello, everyone. Lovely to be with you today. Um, I wanted to start off by just mentioning that the, the detail around the code, the actual wording of the code, is contained in that subordinate legislation that you've heard referred to um, that is still being finalised. So we don't have the actual wording of the code to talk through today. Um, and as you heard from Amy earlier, uh, the department is likely to publish a draft of the code on their website very soon. So coming soon, um, but not for today. But let me talk you through what um, we do know about the code and what I can share with you. Um, as you've heard already, um, this reform starts with many of the others on the 1st of December uh, 2022. Um, the aim is really to improve the safety and well-being uh, for consumers. Um, and also to boost trust in services. Um, it's really setting out uh, the standards of expected behaviour uh, for aged care workers and actually applies to uh, approved aged care providers, uh, their governing persons, so for example, chief executive officers or board members, um, and aged care workers themselves. And by workers, we mean the people employed or otherwise engaged by an approved uh, provider, including volunteers, or um, people employed by a contractor or subcontractor um, that the provider uses to deliver aged care services, and again, including volunteers. Um, in terms of service types, uh, the new code applies to residential care, it applies to home care, and applies to flexible care, uh, which includes the transition care program, uh, multi-purpose services, and short-term restorative care program. Um, the code won't apply uh, to Commonwealth Home Support Program or to the National Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Flexible Aged Care Program, NATSIFAC. Um, generally, the code in terms of provider responsibilities um, the provider responsibilities are generally uh, expected to be consistent with um, current responsibilities under the Aged Care Act and the quality standards. But the code does in, uh, include a requirement for approved providers um, to take responsibility and take reasonable steps to ensure that their workers and governing persons comply with the code. Uh, the Aged Care Quality and Safety Commission, where we're from, um, will be the body responsible for enforcing compliance with the code um, when it's introduced in December. Um, and as always, um, that will involve us taking a risk-based and proportionate uh, approach to the enforcement action that's applied. 
Um, but there are some new powers for us under the code. Um, so for example, in severe risk cases, um, where a worker has been found to be not compliant with the code, um, that we, we can now, uh, from December, we'll be able to issue a banning order um, that will prevent um, them from working in aged care. And on top of that, um, there are court-imposed civil penalties available under the Aged Care Act. Um, so the new code is based on the National Disability Insurance Scheme Code of Conduct um, and also on feedback um, received as part of public consultation on the code um, undertaken by the Department of Health in late 2021. Um, the obligations under the Aged Care Code of Conduct and the NDIS Code of Conduct are substantially the same. Uh, there are slight differences in the language used in the codes to respect the different preferences for the different sectors, um, but essentially the, uh, the requirements are the same. Importantly for um, most of our audience today, um, the responsibilities of providers, governing persons and workers under both codes um, are uh, the same and making that strong focus on the individual's right to receive safe and quality services um, and to have confidence in the workforce and to, to not only feel like they're protected, but to actually be protected. Um, so as you've heard um, in, from Anne, um, similar to the SIRS um, situation, we're working um, closely with the department um, to finalise that subordinate legislation uh, and um, working on getting further information together, uh, guidance for the sector. Um, there'll be guidance for uh, both workers, uh, providers and consumers. Um, and we'll be conducting some public consultations shortly um, on those uh, with uh, selected members of the sector. So that'll be coming um, out very soon. And um, as you've heard, there will be a series of webinars, including specific webinars on the Code of Conduct. Um, and we'll have the, um, the actual wording of the code by then and be able to take you through um, the detail um, much more clearly at that stage. So that's really all um, from me today. Thanks very much, Dana. Thank you, Michelle. Well done. Um, next up is Emma Jobson, uh, uh, another executive director in the commission. Now, Emma uh, is going to deal with two issues consecutively, which are not strongly linked. Um, the first is the additional strengthened obligations on provider governance. Uh, and then she will move on and deal briefly with the new consent provisions in relation to restrictive practices. Thanks, Emma. Thanks, Janet. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. So providers already have responsibilities that require um, their governing bodies to be accountable for the delivery of safe and quality care and services. So the new requirements build on and complement these responsibilities as part of this increased focus on successful governance as a key driver in providing quality and safe care. So the, the new requirements relate to membership, responsibility and responsibilities of the governing bodies, forming advisory bodies and reporting requirements. So the requirements have a staggered implementation. So from 1 December this year, all approved providers will be required to meet reporting, reporting requirements for material changes. For example, a change in key personnel or the subcontracting out of care services. Um, they'll be required to assess the suitability of their key personnel at least annually and report annually on their operations through an annual statement. So all providers will also be required to ensure their governing body has a majority of independent non-executive members with the skills and experience to deliver safe and high quality care, and that at least one member has experience providing clinical care. Providers will also need to establish and continue quality advisory bodies as well as offer consumers and their representatives the opportunity to establish one or more consumer advisory bodies. So for these last three requirements, existing providers will have until 1 December next year, 2023, to meet these requirements. All newly approved providers will need to meet them from 1 December this year, 2022, or from the date they're approved. 
So providers will also be able to apply to the Commission for an exemption regarding membership requirements of their governing bodies. The Commission also has increased powers to review the suitability of key personnel at any time. And the Department of Health and Aged Care will soon be publishing the exposure draft of the subordinate legislation, and this will give us the further details on the requirements. As Lisa outlined, the Commission will then be publishing guidance for providers, which clearly describes their roles and responsibilities in relation to the new requirements and the role of the Commission in regulating those requirements. So the Commission is already supporting providers to operate with best practice governance through the Governing for Reform in Aged Care program for board members and chief executives. The program targets leaders across the sector to understand and engage in the reforms and address issues raised by the Royal Commission into Aged Care Quality and Safety. The program is free to all members of governing bodies and executives of Commonwealth funded residential and home care providers. Learning is flexible, it includes access to webinars, podcasts, action learning groups, workshops and online learning modules and learning resources. So enrolments for the program commenced in March last year and to date almost 2,000 people have enrolled from more than 620 providers. So providers can continue to enrol through our, the Commission's website until June next year, so we encourage you to have a look. I'm now going to talk to you further about um, the latest amendments around governing the use of restrictive practices. So some of you will be familiar with the new requirements that took effect on 1 July 2021. And these detail the limited circumstances in which a restrictive practice can be used. These changes applied to residential care and short-term restorative care, which is delivered in a residential setting. The July 2021 amendments replaced the term restraint with restrictive practice, introduced the term restrictive practices substitute decision maker, which is defined as a person or body under the law of the state or territory in which the consumer is provided with residential aged care, and determined that if the consumer lacks the capacity to give that consent, a restrictive practices substitute decision maker can give informed consent. Further amendments then commenced in 1 September 21 last year, which detailed the behaviour support plan requirements if restrictive practices are to be used or intended to be used. So from December um, 2022 this year, further amendments will set out a hierarchy of persons or bodies authorised to give informed consent for a residential aged care consumer. This hierarchy would only apply if the consumer cannot make an informed decision about whether or not to consent themselves. This change addresses the gap in some states where laws do not currently allow another person or body to give informed consent to the use of restrictive practices on behalf of a consumer. The need for this consent either by the consumer or representative is an important safeguard for consumers. So if consent has already been provided by a person or authorised body authorised to do so, the amendment won't affect this arrangement. So the department has recently published the exposure draft and explanatory statement on these additional amendments and is currently seeking feedback through their consultation hub and that closes Thursday next week. So we encourage you to have a look. So we've already published information and a suite of guidance documents, including scenarios on how to apply the new restraint principles um, on our website and our webpage called Minimising the Use of Restrictive Practices. We will be developing and publishing further guidance um, for providers and consumers as soon as the consultation period on the subordinate is completed. So that's all from me. Thank you, Janet. Wonderful, Emma. Um, thank you. I know people around this mark are probably thinking, wow, this is a lot of information. If you go to our website, you will find information that Lisa shared with you about the, the specific webinars we're going to be convening to deal with each of these topics in sequence. So we've had a number of questions about specific aspects of one of the topics. Uh, we are unlikely to get to all of those questions today. We will be putting responses on our website, but also I commend to you participation in coming webinars, which are going to be specific to a particular measure in the new Act. But 
Now's the, the opportunity uh, to go to some of the pre-submitted questions and to pick up some of the questions you've submitted online uh, as, we've been, as we've been undertaking the webinar today. And I actually want to start by um, uh, taking my own question to, to commence. Uh, and th there was a question which came in through the chat line about um, whether the, the provisions as they apply to re uh, residential aged care will be different from those that apply to home care? And uh, the answer is essentially no. Um, there are subtle distinctions, and I'll just run them through quickly. Um, the, the code of conduct, where it applies to a service, it applies in the same way. So it applies to the approved provider, it applies to the aged care worker, it applies to the governing pers persons. And we'll need to give you more detail about uh, aspects of that uh, in the webinar and also uh, on our website. SIRS in home services is going to be similar as both Amy and Anne said, but not identical to SIRS in residential care for reasons which would be self-evident because it's a different setting, a different way of encountering a, a consumer and providing care for them in their home or in the community. The governance obligations apply to all providers. The restrictive practices, uh, consent provisions by definition apply in residential aged care. So you can see that there are variations across that set of four. But let me answer briefly the second part of the question that I read into it, which is, so what's your regulatory setting going to be? As a commission, how do you approach each of these? What is your engagement with providers in relation to their compliance on these? Now, I'm going to run through this quickly, but it is universally applicable. It is, it is not specific to a particular measure. It is the way we do our work. We start with the positive assumption that each one of you as a provider is motivated to do the right thing. We assume the best of you because most often that proves to be the case. We then offer information, guidance and education to assist you in knowing what you have to do and understanding what's expected of you. Then we monitor your compliance with the provisions, the requirements. Where we identify non-compliance, we take action proportionate to the level of assessed risk. So if consumers are experiencing harm or at risk of harm, uh, then we will move quickly and urgently to ensure that you're taking the necessary steps to keep them safe. And we will monitor the work you do to address the areas of non-compliance that we identify. We will also provide information back to the sector on a general basis so that each of you can benchmark yourself, can get new insights from the collective experience systemically and adjust your settings uh, to achieve continuous improvement. And we also have an obligation to consumers to provide them with the information they need to make informed choices and to advocate on their own behalf. Now, what I've just done in a very short space of time is give you a synopsis of our regulatory strategy. There's a lot more information about that online too, but I did want to assure you uh, that this isn't a separate approach that we're proposing to take. These measures create obligations and we as the regulator will work with you to support you to understand them and then we will monitor your compliance with them. Now, another question we received uh, before the webinar goes to the resourcing question. And Amy, the question is essentially, um, can you please briefly address a concern as to whether these additional measures will introduce additional costs and how providers should understand the ways in which they should um, approach that. Thanks, Janet. So yes, um, many of the obligations um, will provide additional costs, but some of the measures also provide additional funding to the sector. And a big one of that is the ANAC measure that I talked about earlier. That adds, I think, somewhere in the order of $5 billion to the, to the sector. And in fact, I think, you know, I talked about $18 billion government investment. I, I understand that at least $8 billion of that will go into the sector to support providers. We have done a little bit of an analysis, kind of weighed up that increase in funding with the, um, with the you know, potential burns of, of measures such as, such as SIRS. And the analysis that we've undertaken shows that um, in response to the Royal Commission that, that providers will be in a stronger financial um, um, position following those changes. Okay. Um, and you're allowed to ask that question more than once. I'm saying this to the participants because I know it's something that people think about. Um, I, I look at it as an investment 
that you are making in quality and safety, which will pay you dividends uh, in the short, medium and longer term in delivering a better consumer experience, but also in creating certain efficiencies down the track. But it, you'll have to explore that for yourselves and prove that to be the case uh, in your own experience. There is also a very strong line of questions in relation to when there will be clarity on the detail. You clearly and understandably want um, more information, more detail on, on the, the guidance so that you can do your work on policies, procedures, staff training and so on. Now, both Amy and uh, Lisa have addressed this in part, but let me invite Lisa uh, back in. Lisa, can you just uh, reiterate some of what you said earlier to give people a level of assurance that this information is coming to them and that they can access it? Um, so, as we said, the, um, our, our, the guidance materials that we pull together for you need to build out from the, from the legislation and the detail in the subordinate legislation really gets to the kind of the nitty gritty and the sorts of things that the sector's really gonna to wanna to know. So our trigger for being able to produce really detailed guidance and information for you is the publication of that um, subordinate legislation. Now, the timing of that is a decision for government, but I think our, our expectation is that that's likely to be sometime around late September. So our guidance will start to flow um, shortly after that. Um, we know, you know, as I mentioned, we're working very closely with the department. We want to make sure that we've got the right information for providers, for consumers and for workers. Um, we'll, we're putting together that suite of online resources that I spoke about. We'd really welcome your feedback on what's going to be most useful for you. So really encourage you to use the chat function today or send us an email um, and let us know what might be most helpful for you. The questions that we're getting from you today are actually incredibly helpful because this helps us to understand the sorts of issues that we need to make sure that we make clear in the materials that we that we send through. So there's a number that, um, that, that go to a level of detail, as Janet said, that we're not able to answer today, but please keep sending them through um, because it's helpful for us to understand exactly what we need to nail for you. Thanks, Janet. Okay. You heard it from Lisa. A um, couple of questions about provider governance. So I'll invite Emma back on. Emma, um, the, there have been questions that people are looking for a little more clarity to the extent that we can provide it now in relation to these, the board subcommittee um, and then the consumer advisory committee. And I know that there are different provisions relating to both of those. Can you just go into that in a bit more detail, please? Sure, Janet, thanks. Yes, um, look, some providers are raising the questions about subcommittees they may already have um, that would do the role of a quality advisory body. So that's really positive. Some providers already have these bodies in place. So there's no expectation that um, providers need to replace these bodies, but rather providers need to ensure that the bodies will meet the requirements in the new legislation. So including the accountability principles when available and make adjustments if they need to. So our guidance will be able to provide more detail on that once the subordinate legislation is available. The um, consumer advisory bodies. Uh, so the consumer advisory bodies um, uh, uh, changes require that providers offer at least once every 12 months. Care recipients and their representatives the opportunity to establish one or more consumer advisory bodies. The role is to give providers feedback about the quality of care provided. Um, if the consumers or their representatives choose not to establish um, such a body, that is up to them and the providers won't be held to account for that. However, the Commission does expect that providers make genuine attempts and at least annually uh, to support consumers and representatives to establish a forum to give them a voice on quality of care issues. Um, so providers will need to clearly document that process and those outcomes. Thank you, Janet. Um, thank you, Emma. Um, just staying with you briefly uh, and continuing on with provider governance, one more question. Uh, a, uh, somebody before the webinar asked um, what, what we mean by independent directors when uh, it replies to a church-based not-for-profit organisation. And yeah. I just wonder if you could offer a brief comment on that. 
Yeah, thanks, Janet. Look, the legislation does not specify who qualifies as an independent non-executive member. However, the Commission considers um, that an independent non-executive member would be someone who does not hold position in the organisation. So, for example, isn't a member of the executive team, um, isn't able to be influenced by their connection with the organisation or doesn't have a conflict of interest. Um, so it's able to act objectively and independently in the best interests of consumers. Um, so we encourage providers to consider engaging people um, who are aware of the organisation but um, and can contribute to its governance, but who can take a role in challenging and objectively analysing the organisation's position and holding um, management to account. Okay. I'm going to stay with you a bit longer, um, but on a very different topic, the other uh, topic that you also addressed, uh, which is uh, the consent provisions for restrictive practices. You you move through the sentence fairly quickly. So can you just mm. uh, take us back to this hierarchy uh, and, and that concept? How is that concept applied where the individual who may be the subject of a restrictive practice is unable to give consent on their own behalf? Thanks, Janet. Yeah. Um, so under the so the main feature of these further amendments, as you've you've pointed out, is the hierarchy of persons or bodies authorised to give informed consent um, for older people who live in residential aged care um, specifically. So this only applies if the recipient cannot give informed consent themselves. Um, and under the hierarchy, uh, a restrictive practices decision maker could be an authority, so a state or territory body a nominee, a care recipient's partner, relative or friend, or medical treatment authority. Our guidance is going to step through the detail around these definitions that is in the legislation. So we'll be talking to you more about that. Um, I think, yeah, and as we said earlier, the, the subordinate has been released and is open for consultation. So we really encourage you to have a look and engage with that process because these are important concepts and definitions. Okay. When Emma uses the word subordinate and, and Amy uses as well, that's probably um, very obscure to, to most of you who are unfamiliar with parliamentary processes. It's not the main act. It is a legislative instrument, uh, but it doesn't have to go through the same processes for passage through both houses of parliament. So essentially, uh, often, subordinate legislation is where you will find the rules that pertain to the implementation of something which is in primary legislation, which has gone through in the Act. So these rules are clearly vitally important. Uh, every one of us is keen to get access to them, to understand them and to apply them. Uh, and uh, as uh, Amy and Lisa both said, uh, we're expecting that uh, they should become available later in September, possibly in some instances early October, but very, very soon. And we will make it up uh, our, our business to ensure that you're aware of them and that they do become available. Let me move on to SIRS and, and bring Anne back in. Um, and there are a number of questions which have been raised uh, both in the webinar and beforehand about um, the, the detail of distinctions between SIRS in home services and SIRS in residential services. And I know uh, we're not yet well placed to speak to that. You know, the questions that have come in are, will, for example, there be eight incident types? Uh, will the same categorisation into priority one and priority two apply? And, and I think, I mean, it's a bit of a, 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 a um, you know, I, I guess I'm asking you to repeat an earlier answer, but uh, we really aren't able to understand this detail yet, but it should be with us shortly. Would that be fair? Uh, yes, Janet. And look, I also want to assure people that um, the, um, the decision tool that we have had, um, decision to support tool that we've had, um, really positive feedback from the sector on in relation to SIRS in residential will be there to support you in relation to SIRS um, for home services. So we want you to understand that the same range of resources and supports will be there. So as soon as we've got more information, we can start creating that, that um, uh, um, uh, support for you. We note that it's the most popular um, page um, on our website in relation to SIRS. We also, um, you know, we met with some providers um, uh, week before last in Adelaide 
and we've got some really good feedback about the types of resources that really work for you. Um, we're working on a, um, a fact sheet that you can provide to um, your subcontractors. And we're also working on um, a, a resource that should work both for your, um, your staff and for consumers um, so that there can be a joint understanding of, of what SIRS for home services looks like. So uh, we will um, be um, um, ready um, to support you from your first notification um, on 1 December, but we're also going to be working with you after that to refine our resources and ensure that we are um, assisting you understand how to uh, participate and engage with this scheme. Okay, so more information to come and keep an eye out also for the webinars that we will convene specific to that particular measure. Um, moving on to Michelle and the Code of Conduct, we've received a question, Michelle, uh, in relation to the obligation to providers. So, so given that the providers are the employers of uh, aged care workers, um, whether they're contracted or, or actually on staff, what role is envisaged for providers in ensuring that all staff comply with the code of conduct? Thanks, Janet. Yeah, um, look, providers will have a key role uh, in, uh, in, in making sure that the code of conduct is complied with. Um, they have a responsibility themselves to comply with the code as a provider, um, but also uh, the code will contain a requirement uh, for providers to take reasonable steps to make sure that their workers comply with the code. So that's um, whether they employ them directly or whether they're through um, subcontractors. Um, and as I say, a broad definition of worker in that sense, um, including uh, volunteers. So, you know, providers will really have a key responsibility and will be key in making sure that the code is actually complied with by them um, as under their responsibilities, but also taking that key responsibility for their workers to comply as well. Okay. Again, stay tuned for the, the webinar, which is going to be specific to the code and also the imminent release of, of the, the code uh, as an exposure. That's probably uh, as much time as we have for questions. Thank you, everyone who submitted before the webinar and those many of you who submitted uh, questions during the webinar. As we've said a few times now, we will be gathering these together, uh, drawing through the key themes and providing the Q&A, the, the question and the response on our website, and that will grow over time. So I recommend that you have a tab uh, on your computer where you can just visit, drop into our website at any time and update yourself with the most recent Q's and A's because uh, there's a bit of time to pass between now and December and they are bound to grow steadily. Let me close by acknowledging that this is a, a challenge at a challenging time. Uh, there is not too much time between now and December but we will do everything we can to assist you in lifting and leaning in, understanding what you need to do and getting yourself sorted. We place a high premium on effort. If we see you really working hard on this, our level of trust and confidence in you as a provider is inevitably higher. So we really want you to be paying attention addressing your knowledge needs in order that you can do the work uh, wherever you, wherever you uh, operate your service. Please visit our website often. Thank you for the questions. We will address them. Uh, my particular thanks to Amy, Lisa, Michelle, Anne and Emma for joining us today and, and sharing the information they have. As I said earlier, a copy of this webinar, a recording of it, will be made available on our website. And please uh, direct others' attention to it. And I would also like to remind you that uh, a repeat of this live webinar will occur next Tuesday at 2 p.m. Uh, Australian Eastern Standard Time. Uh, you can watch it again if you want. Uh, come along next Tuesday, feel free. Uh, or uh, recommend it to your friends if you consider that there would be merit in, in others joining who may not have been able to get to us today. We will continue to engage with you, have my firm commitment on that. 
Thank you to all of you who've uh, followed us through this hour. We look forward to further engagement with you to assist you to shine and to deliver a quality experience for every single aged care consumer. Thanks, everyone. Have a great afternoon.